Let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 14, beginning with verse 20. People are made up of all sizes, shapes, colors, kinds. It is interesting for me to note the extremely wide variety that God has been able to create using basic factors. Now all of us basically have an eyes, nose, mouth, chin, forehead, etc. And yet look at the variety of faces. No two of our faces are alike. God has been able to create such a wide variety just using the same basic ingredients and yet, dive, you know, just little changes here and there so that all of us look different from each other. But that goes far beyond our looks. It is interesting that they are now developing computers that will read palms. So they say that everybody's hand is different. The length of your fingers, the shapes of your fingers, the uh, palm itself, there's enough difference in everybody's palm that they can actually program a computer to read your palm. That is to identify you by your palm print. And so they are hoping to solve some of the identity problems by having a palm identifiers where you just lay your hand down on the uh, computer screen and it will read your uh, the shape and all and tell you who you are uh, by the way your palm is or your hand is shaped. Goes further than that. Each of us are made up differently emotionally. We don't all think alike. No wonder there are so many wars in the world with everybody being so different. And yet, it is God's purposes that though there be a wide diversity of personalities and of likes and of traits, that we all be one together in Jesus Christ. He is the common denominator by which we are all to be one. Now, that does not mean that we're all to believe exactly the same way and we're all to become uh, the same kind of uh, reactions, e emotionally and all. The diversity continues. God doesn't cease making you, you. God allows you to continue to be what you are. And yet He desires that with the wide diversities there still be this unity together. Bound in the love of Jesus Christ. Now for that to happen, there's got to be a lot of give and a lot of take. Now, you that are married know that that's the key to marriage. A 60-40 proposition. <laughs> you give 60 and take 40. Now if you do that on both sides, you, you come out equal. Isn't it interesting the differences that you can discover in each other once you're married? When you're going together, you think that, oh my, we're in just perfect harmony. We agree on everything. 
We agree on colors, we agree on food, we agree on music, we, you know, we just have the same likes all the way through. This is so marvelous, it must have been made in heaven. But it's amazing how that after we're married we can find so many things that we disagree on. But we learn to accept one another. We learn to accept our differences. If we're wise, we learn to respect the differences. And we learn to let each other be what we are. My wife and I were talking tonight at the table about our differences. Uh, they keep categorizing people in different types of categories. And, uh, you know, they had the choleric and the sanguine and the melancholy and and all. Now they've got new categories and I've been put in a new classification. But it's just a part of my makeup <laughs> of uh, doing things my way. If I have to uh, do certain things, I have a way of doing them. And you may suggest that I try to do it another way, and I respect your suggestion, but I'm apt to go ahead and continue to do it my way. That which is natural for me. Now, if I would try and do it your way, it would probably not be natural for me. And so we each have to do what is natural for us. And we learn to do things. that which is most natural for us. Now, with all of these differences, there does exist a difference of belief in what, as a Christian, I can do and what I can't do as a child of God. Someone says, well, does God have double standards? No, God doesn't have double standards. But among men, because of the multiplicity of backgrounds and ideas and thoughts, cultures, what may be right to one is not right to another may, what may be wrong to one is not necessarily wrong to another and there are a lot of things that fall in this gray area of which there is no express teaching in the scriptures and so in these areas where the scriptures do not expressly spell out what our action should be, there must be a lot of latitude in our relationships with each other not to try to control another person's life with my convictions. And that's what this whole 14th chapter has been about. Now, Paul is closing the chapter with exhortation to those who do feel a greater liberty in doing certain things that other people have been convicted against. 
And he is telling them how they should exercise that liberty that they feel. And in verse 20, Paul declares, For meat, destroy not the work of God. This is all a part of that walking in love that Paul told us we were to do. For you see, I may feel a perfect liberty to eat any kind of meat. Shrimp, lobster, shark, halibut, which all were forbidden under the Mosaic Law. Pork chops, ham, bacon. I may feel a perfect liberty at, at, at eating these meats. Whereas other people, because they were forbidden under the dietary portion of the Mosaic Law, may feel convictions against eating this type of meat. And they may feel that it would be sinful to eat that kind of meat. Now, if we go out to dinner together, and I know that they have these convictions, then it would be wrong for me, eating dinner with them, to order shrimp. And clam chowder. It might stumble them. And Paul said, don't, through your meat, destroy the work of God. It might so affect them that they would be upset. They would begin to judge and, and it would just really destroy them to see me exercising that kind of liberty, eating things that they feel uh, guilty about eating themselves. So, it is important that I become very sensitive to my brother's convictions and to his needs. Now, this is something that I am really not naturally. I'm not a sensitive person. And I have gotten into a lot of trouble because I'm not sensitive as I should be. I'm just sort of a coarse, rough makeup. My wife, on the other hand, is extremely sensitive. But that's because she's a woman. And basically, women are made up of a keener, finer emotional texture. And that's great. That's what we love about them. That beautiful, fine sensitivity. But because they are so sensitive, they are capable of higher heights and deeper depth. I move in a spectrum that is fairly narrow, rough, coarse. <laughs> I don't get very high and I don't get very low. I stay in this sort of level middle. My wife can move way high, makes her exciting. Kids never would share with me their exciting news, they'd always wait for mama. She'd react, she'd scream, <laughs> get all excited. Dad says, oh, that's fine. 
So they love to have the reactions. They don't want to just hear, oh, that's fine. They want a reaction. They want a response. And so they tell their mom. Something bad happened. They wouldn't tell me. I'd say, oh, that's too bad, isn't it? <laughs> but mom would react. She'd be ready to call the police or the FBI or something else. You know, just <laughs> got to do something. I've had to pray about becoming more sensitive. That's something that I've really sought the Lord for. Because in the ministry, it is important that I become more sensitive to people's needs. And I've really been seeking the Lord to help me to become more sensitive. It isn't my nature. So I know that it's going to take a work of the Spirit to really make me sensitive as I ought to be sensitive. If somebody has some... And there I go, I'm almost insensitive again. I was going to say some weird conviction against aging shrimp. But... If you have a conviction against eating shrimp, I ought to be sensitive to that and recognize it and say, my, you know, that's interesting, you know. <laughs> Rather than saying, that's dumb. <laughs> but I need to be sensitive to these differences and seek not to offend someone I am not to live just for my own conscience. But I am to be considerate of another person's conscience also. And for meat, insisting upon my right to eat any kind of meat I want, I shouldn't over such a foolish, silly thing destroy the work of God in my brother's life. The work of God in his life is far more important than my lamb chop or T-bone steak. Now Paul said, all things indeed are pure. If you have enough liberty in Christ, you know that all things are to be received with thanksgiving. Ask God to bless it. Well, I think there are limits on that too. When we were in Bible college, we'd go over to my apartment, a bunch of us guys, after in the evening on the way home from school. We'd stop by the market and we'd buy a gallon of ice cream and a pint of whipping cream, chocolate syrup, bananas, almonds. <laughs> and we'd go home and we'd get these big bowls and we'd load them up, you know, and pour everything on. And then someone would say, who's going to pray? <laughs> and I said, you've got to be kidding. You can't in good conscience ask God to bless this. <laughs> and use it to strengthen our bodies. <laughs> you know it isn't good for you. So just eat it and suffer the consequences, <laughs> but don't ask God to bless it. All things are to be received with thanksgiving. Yes, I can give thanks for it, but I surely can't ask Him to bless it. All things indeed are pure. Paul was surely a liberated person. 
as Paul expresses his own ethics that he had received from the Lord. He was an extremely liberated person. I, I really believe that Paul no doubt did eat uh, pork chops and all. I, I don't think Paul had any problem with things like that. All things indeed are pure. You see, I might be able to rationally show that what I am doing is right. If we get into an argument and we start to argue the merits, I may be able to prove to you that what I am doing is just as right as what you are doing. You say, I shouldn't eat that because my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and that isn't good for me to eat that. And I should honor and respect my body as the temple of the Holy Ghost. Well, do you drink coffee? you drink Cokes? Now these things are also harmful to the body. So that I may be able to make my point and prove that what I am doing is right. But my right becomes wrong if it destroys someone else. So what is pure becomes evil if it brings an offense to my weak brother. You see, I have liberty. But I must be careful how I exercise my liberty. For Paul said, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do things that would stumble my brother or offend my brother or make him weak. So I have to be concerned with his feelings, with his conscience. And I should not do that which would stumble him. As Paul said in verse 13, Let no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's path. Or those things that would offend my brother. And in verse 15, if your brother be grieved with your meat, then if you go ahead and eat in front of him, you're not walking in love. Or I should seek not to make my brother weak. That is, if my liberty in doing a particular thing gives him boldness to go ahead and do the same thing because he sees me do it, and yet his conscience is weak and it begins to bother him and trouble him that he did it, then I have laid before him a stumbling block to cause him to fall. Now you may argue, but I have the faith to do it. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't give it a second thought. I know that all things are pure and everything is cleansed through prayer. And I have the faith to do it and I don't see anything wrong with doing it. Well, Paul said, if you have that kind of faith, then have it to yourself. Don't do it openly where they might see you and be stumbled by it. But have your, have your faith to yourself before God. Do those things in the privacy of your own home or where others will not be offended or apt to see you do it and be offended. 
Now Paul makes a very broad and interesting statement declaring, Happy is he that condemns not himself in the things that he allows. Oh, how happy is the man who doesn't feel condemnation. Happy is the man who doesn't condemn himself for the things that he allows. Now, we must be careful not to take this outside of the context of eating and drinking. Happy is the man who can eat meat without it bothering him. You see, don't take this beyond the context, as some people are prone to do. Paul is not here talking of things that are expressly forbidden in the Scriptures. There are those who would carry this particular Scripture to unscriptural excesses, to such things as fornication, or adultery, or drunkenness, or, or something of that nature, and they say, well, my conscience doesn't bother me. I'm happy in the things that I allow, you know. Uh, this is dealing in context with whether or not I eat meat or not, or whether or not I drink wine or not. Happy is the man who is not condemned by the things which he allows. I am never at liberty to do those things that are expressly forbidden in the Scriptures. My freedom and liberty in Christ is not a freedom to walk after the flesh. It is a freedom from walking after the flesh. I should not do those things for which I feel condemnation. Even if I see someone that I highly respect doing it. For instance, let us say that I went out to dinner with someone that I highly respect, say Billy Graham, and that he ordered wine with his dinner. I don't think he drinks wine, but uh, just for sake of illustration. I highly admire and respect him. And if we went out to dinner together and he ordered wine, that doesn't mean that I have the freedom to order wine because I am convicted personally against drinking wine. And I would not be free to say, well, Billy Graham does it, and so that means, you know, it's all right for me. Because if he did drink wine, it may be all right for him. I'm sure it would be all right for him to drink wine if he did not feel convictions against it. I do. So I should not do those things that I feel convicted against even if I see someone else that I highly admire doing them. That does not give me the liberty to do them. I must be true to my own personal convictions before God as you must be true to your own convictions before God. For Paul goes on to say, He that doubteth is damned if he eat. If you go ahead and violate your own conscience, you've got to live with your conscience. And there is a saying that the conscience will out. We cannot live with guilt feelings. 
somehow we are made up to where we just can't live under the feeling of constant guilt. And if I am doing that which I, in my own heart, feel or think is wrong, I'm having now this guilt complex over what I am doing, subconsciously, I desire punishment in order that I might be absolved of these feelings of guilt. Maybe it's a carry back to my childhood. When I was guilty, I got punished, but yet in the punishment there was some kind of a glorious uh, purging within that somehow I'm not guilty anymore. I've been punished for it. So when I feel a sense of guilt, subconsciously I desire punishment and because my dad isn't around to take me in the bedroom and give me a licking anymore, Subconsciously, I need to be purged of this feeling of guilt. So subconsciously, I begin an abnormal behavioral pattern that is designed to bring punishment. I was not really a good disciplinarian as a parent. I would let my kids get by with a lot of things. In fact, I oftentimes tried to help them develop excuses so I wouldn't have to spank them because I just didn't like spanking them. Though at times they needed it, I just didn't like to do it and so um, when I would go to spank them, uh, they'd say, last chance, daddy, last chance. All right, last chance, you know. <laughs> and I was glad to give them the last chance and the very last chance and the absolutely <laughs> last chance. But there were times especially with our youngest daughter, when she would not give us an excuse. We would say, all right, stop it now, honey. And, and she'd sass. And we'd say, don't you talk back to us. And she'd continue. And I say, if you continue doing that, I'm going to have to spank you. And she'd keep it up. And, and she would bait and bait and bait until we would spank her. I mean, she'd just force you. And quite often when this process was going on, I'd say to my wife, I wonder what she really feels guilty about. I knew that something was troubling her. She had done something wrong. We weren't at the real issue. But because she was feeling guilty, she wanted to be spanked. And so she would force us, really, to spank her. She would not stop until we had giving her, given her a spanking. And I'd say to my wife, well, you know, she's done something and she needs it, so guess we better get it over with, you know. And so many times I spanked her, but I really didn't know what I was really spanking her for. Somehow she knew. <laughs> she was getting rid of guilt. 
But this is, in a sense, and she, you see, she would get into an abnormal behavioral pattern that would bring her punishment. She would continue until the punishment came. Now, we do that as adults. We cannot live with a feeling of guilt. And so we begin an abnormal behavioral pattern that is designed to bring punishment. And we will bait, we will egg, we will taunt, we will gripe, we will continue until they lash out at us. And of course, usually it's a verbal lashing. And then we feel a sense of relief while they don't know what happened. We cannot live with guilt. He that doubts is damned. I, I just cannot violate my conscience. It will out. Because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Therefore, I may have from some early background or cultural background or whatever, I may have very strong feelings about certain things. It is best that I be obedient to those feelings. My mother, who was an extremely beautiful person and the most godly woman I've ever known, had a tremendous influence upon my life. There was just a gentle beauty about her that was just unique. And from the time I was a little kid, she always told me how bad cigarettes were. How bad they were for your health. How bad they were for your skin. How they made your teeth yellow. And she'd go on with, with the evils of cigarettes from the time I was a little kid. Never touch a cigarette, son. Never touch one. That was so ingrained in me. It's so a part of my very being. That when I walk through the courtyard and I see a cigarette butt, I have difficulty picking the thing up. I pick it up just like I would pick up a dead rat or something. <laughs> just, and then I go wash my hands. I just, it's just something that's been inbred in me. So that I could never smoke a cigarette and uh, in faith, because it's culturally, culturally inbred in me so heavily against it. I've never had a puff of a cigarette in my entire life. I've never had a cigarette to my lips in my entire life. Oh, my. I mean, I've been so enculturated against it. And the same with an alcoholic beverage. I have never had a taste of an alcoholic beverage. But again, that was something that was so deeply in bred in me from early childhood. 
that you may say, oh, but wine, that, what, you know, goodness, Jesus turned the water to wine and all, and, and you may give me all the arguments, but I could never drink a swallow of it and, and not feel guilty. And so uh, here I am in verse 23. He that doubts is damned. If I, if I would do it, it would be a violation of my conscience. You say, well, that didn't come from God, that came from your mother. Perhaps so, but it's there and I can't remove it. It's a part of me now. And I accept it as a part of me and I live in accordance to it. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And I couldn't really in faith say, God, bless this cigarette I'm about to smoke. I thank you for it, Lord, for my addiction to this little thing. <laughs> Lord, bless this shot I'm about to take. You see, if you can't in faith ask God to bless it, <laughs> then should you be doing it? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So, here we are. I've expressed certain convictions that I have. These are areas of dispute. I would not argue with you on these issues. If you would come up to me after service and say, well, I don't have any problem smoking. I enjoy a cigarette. It calms me and it does just so much for me. And I really love smoking. I would have to say, have you faith? Fine. Have it to yourself before God. Please don't smoke around here. <laughs> I mean, what you do when you're in your own home is, is your own business. And I'm not about to try and lay any trips upon you, especially guilt trips, making you feel guilty for those things that you feel a freedom of doing. I believe that the Holy Spirit is the one that does deal with us on these issues. And, of course, you that have been around uh, through the years and have been under my ministry know that I do not make a point of coming down on, uh, on issues, on things like this. I never get into the preaching of holiness as far as things are concerned, the do's and the don'ts. I leave that with the Holy Spirit to work out in your heart and in your life. I think that it is better for us to just press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God and those things that will hinder us in this race will naturally just begin to drop off as I become obsessed with the crown and, and the winning of the race. As I'm looking unto Jesus and I'm striving towards that mark, those things that impede and hinder will just naturally drop off. God will deal with these issues in your heart. And if the Lord deals with them and they are gone, then they're gone for good. If you only quit because every sermon I'm coming down heavy and ranting and raving against, you know, these horrible evils and these ugly sins and all this kind of stuff, then, then you may be just living under another man's conscience. And it isn't really something you feel yourself. And you may drop it for a while, but the problem is when you take it up again, you might really feel guilty because you've heard so many sermons against it, you see. The church that I grew up in, 
there were many sermons against smoking and drinking. I not only got it at home, I got it in church. We were taught as children from Sunday school on up that you could not possibly be a Christian and smoke. And that teaching destroyed a lot of my friends. Because as they got into their, even pre-teens, you know, they were in the experimental kind of a thing. What does a cigarette taste like and all? And a lot of them began to, you know, pick up cigarette butts and light them and smoke them. But because of this teaching, you can't be a Christian and smoke, they dropped out of church. Because they believed that they could not be a Christian and smoke. And if you believe that strong enough, you can't be, you see. Because whatsoever is not a faith is sin. And so if you are taught this and you've come to believe this, then it becomes so in your life. As it would be so in my life. But because it is so in my life, it would not necessarily be so in your life. I'll never forget how shocked I was when I found out that Spurgeon smoked cigars. Of all things, cigars. That's worse than a cigarette. <laughs> G. Campbell Morgan smoked a pipe. Now, I couldn't do those things. And because they had the liberty to do them, it doesn't give me the liberty. I said, well, G. Campbell, you know, get my pipe, you know. No, I can never do it. I can never do it. So, each of us are responsible for ourselves before God. Each one of us are going to give an account of ourselves to Jesus Christ. And God, who made us in such a wide variety, also deals with us individually. And God deals with you as an individual. According to your own characteristics, according to your own makeup, thus God deals with you. If you're a very emotional person, then God deals with you emotionally. If you're a very logical person, then God deals with you logically. God respects the variety and the differences and deals with each of us individually according to our own personal makeup. God is so good and so loving as He deals with us, His children. If any of you have had more than one child, if you've had as many as four children, you've discovered that your children are all different and you cannot use the same tactics and discipline on all of them. You have to deal with them individually. And that's exactly what the Scripture tells us. Train up a child according to his ways. According to his nature, his temperament. Recognizing that we are all different. And, and it, it is interesting, and we should appreciate the differences. And, and surely I do with my children, uh, each of them separate, distinct individuals with their own little characteristics that make them different from each other, so that made the, the disciplining different, made the response different. With some of them, all we had to do is say something, and it was fine with others. Some, you know, you had to beat it into them. 
I mean, they're different and you have to deal with them according to their differences. Even as God deals with us according to our differences. Some of us respond easily to God. Some of us are stubborn. And so God deals with us according to our temperament, our makeup, and um, respects the differences that are there. Now, we also must respect the differences that exist. Not seeking to offend, not seeking to stumble, not seeking to hinder a weak brother, but walking in love, respecting his convictions, his feelings, and not really trying to change the way he feels. Leave that with the Lord. Now, this has nothing to do with the message tonight. But I had a very special experience with the Lord this afternoon. We've been in quite a bit of pressure because of all of the things that need to be done before our trip. And um, just to compound things, uh, some problems arose at home today. Kay called and felt it was necessary that I come home immediately to take care of them. And so when I got home, she unloaded on me <laughs> the pressures that she was feeling. Thank God he made me sensitive and I was able to understand and to encourage her and strengthen her. But then our daughter received a phone call from one of these perverted minds and our daughter Jan is about as pure and beautiful a person as you could ever meet she always she has been God's gift to us from the day she was born. We've loved Jan with a special love. We love them all with a special love, but and each one has their own place within our hearts and if I talk about each of them individually, I talk about they're the greatest in the world because to us they are. But Jan is special, a gift of God, and we've always said she's just God's gift to us, her gentle, beautiful nature. And to have some weirdo call and give vent to the cesspool that is within them. Disturbs me immensely. I... only wish that I could be shut up in a room for a half hour or so with the person. I'd like to talk to them. <laughs> and so to help alleviate part of Kay's problems it was necessary that I go out and trim a tree that was hanging over on the house. <laughs> because the rats were coming off the tree onto the roof and into the attic. One evidently died up there and the flies were in the house from this dead rat. And that's the thing that bothered Kay. And I suppose that would bother any woman. 
The flies were sort of sickly. They can't fly too well. And to have a house full of large black sickly flies is sort of a miserable thing. So I got a fogger and set it off in the attic and then went, uh, fortunately found the place where the rats were coming in but realized that they were climbing our sapota tree and onto the roof and into the house. So I went out to trim the sapota tree. And of course, uh, that isn't what I had in mind to be doing today. And so through my mind were going all of the things that I would have rather been doing than trimming that sapota tree. And the Lord began to speak to my heart and made the whole afternoon worthwhile. The Lord spoke to my heart. I felt very strong impressions of the Lord's Spirit speaking to my heart, saying, you know how upset you are when someone attacks your daughter whom you love so deeply. You know how that makes you feel. That's how I feel when someone attacks you. And oh Lord, <laughs> far out. <laughs> the love of my Father for me. The love of my Father for you, your Father for you. He sort of spoke to my heart and said, You're the apple of my eye. I love you. And I want to defend you against those that would come against you just like you would love to defend your daughter against those that come against her. And the Lord just sort of began to reveal to me a little bit of how much he does love us. And oh, what a beautiful afternoon it's been. As God just sort of manifest his love to my heart. Rumors have it that I'm the richest man in Orange County. <laughs> but I'm not denying them. I think I am. Not the wealthiest, but the richest. I am so rich. When I look at my children, when I look at my wife, when I look at my grandchildren, when I look at you, when I look at the over 300 churches that have sprung out of this one, when I look at the over 100 radio stations, and I, and I see all that God has privileged us to do and to see, I am the richest man in Orange County. Probably California. Maybe even the world. Oh, the depth of the riches that are ours in Christ Jesus. Those glorious riches. Thank God for them. Father, we do thank you that we are so rich that we are so blessed, that you've been so good to us, Lord, that you love us so much. And so, Father, we thank you that the Spirit makes us aware of your love. And then just draws us unto yourself. Lord, continue the work of your spirit within our hearts. Help us, Lord. Help us in dealing with our brothers. That we might walk in love. That we might be sensitive, Lord. 
understanding, patient, long-suffering, learning, Lord, to accept and receive each other, though we may possess differences. God, help us that we will not let our differences make any difference. In Jesus' name, amen.